Okay, so <clears throat> to make my pattern, um, I'm going to be using this Kix box just because that was what was in the recycling. And as you can see, I've already measured out a six by six inch square. So for my pattern, I need um, five by five inch squares and five by five inch triangles. I like to have about a half an inch seam allowance just in case anything weird happens. I know a lot of people do quarter inch. Quarter inch is fine if that's good for you. I like to have a half an inch um, just because it always seems smaller than it's supposed to be when I make them. So, mine are six inches by six inches. I'm using the cardboard because it'll hold up a little bit better than paper. And also, um, because it's a cardboard box, I already have a nice right angle here. So, this is my square on this side, and I've measured out six inches on this side and six inches on this side for my triangle. So I'll just make the angled side there. Uh, where's my pencil? There it is. So those are my two pattern pieces for this um, quilt that I'm making. And this is just my triangle and this is my square. I really honestly don't even need to mark them because, let's face it, it's a triangle and a square. Now, because these are going to be your raw edges that will be inside the quilt, you really don't have to worry about it being perfectly straight. But, you know, try to cut a nice straight line. If you like the pat, I mean, you can, you can keep these for the same quilt pattern if you want to make it again. Or if you want to share it with your friends, or if you want to use them to make your own design, or a different design, if you are making your own. Now, my first, and well, not my first quilt, my first quilt was a log cabin quilt, which is a fairly easy and well-known pattern. And uh, the second one I made was essentially a sampler that wasn't actually made of samples. I just made a bunch of samples to make a sampler quilt. Um, this one is kind of a Native American sort of pattern. Um, and it just uses squares and triangles. All of the same size, so it's very easy and straightforward and uncomplicated which is what I need right now. <laughs> um, this is going to be from a big boy um, for his next birthday which isn't until July and it may sound like I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself but I would rather have it done ahead of time than run out of time. So. That's why I'm starting it now. So there's my triangles and my squares. I'm gonna grab my material, or a piece of my material, and show you how I just do a quick check to make sure that I have enough material uh, to put where I'm planning on putting it. All right, so I'm back. Um, I'm gonna show you with my smallest piece, which will go in the middle of my pattern. Um, I know it looks like it's taking up the whole space, but here it is in fourths. So it's really not that big of a piece. It's, let's see, it's about 14 by 20 maybe. So it's not that big of a piece. It's the smallest piece I have for this quilt. <laughs> and uh, just for general purposes, the way I make sure I have enough is I take my pattern and say for this piece of material, I need four pieces. So I just roughly one, two, three, four. Okay, I have enough for that. Obviously, I have enough to do, I don't know, maybe uh, eight or maybe nine, probably nine pieces this size, but I only need four. So I'm not gonna show you on a bigger piece because that would be difficult. Um, but I am going to show you a trick that I learned actually in a quilting class um, for making sure that your edges are straight. 
Now this is especially important um, when you're using fabric scraps that you've got in places because you don't know if the person just chopped it or if they made a straight line, a straight edge, or if they were using a curved pattern. Obviously this is not a completely straight line. It has a little bit of a curve to it here. It goes up on the sides. So that's a bit of a problem. So the easiest way to make sure that you have a straight edge is you, here, let me show you, there you go. So you find the edge and uh, you take your scissors and you cut about where you feel the narrowest is. So I think this is about how far it is. So I cut there and then you just rip it and it will rip a straight edge following the threads and that's how you get a straight edge. Now after you do that it'll be all ripply because you ripped it. Ripple, rip, yeah. Um, so after you do that you're going to want to iron that to make it nice and flat. Um, you can do the sides as well so you make sure you have um, nice square edges for your pattern to rest on. So I need a squared edge here. Um, as you can see that is not square. So what I'm going to do is I am going to Guinevere. No running. <sighs> Baby's sleeping. They never listen. So I'm going to cut a little bit there. I didn't cut that enough. I'm going to cut a little bit right there. And that's going to give me a straight edge there. Now, I am keeping all of these little scraps. Something like this is too thin. But this end of it, I'm going to keep. I'm going to make a patchwork quilt that's on point. So now that that's ready, I can iron that. Well, I can cut it first because I have seam allowances. And then iron it. So I'll cut this. Make four of them. And then I can iron them, and those will be my middle pieces. Okay, so I have those cut. I haven't ironed them yet, but I will iron them before I sew them. So now they are six inch squares, and I have to decide which way the patterns lay better together. Um, let's see. That's not too bad. Um, let's see. Maybe that's a little bit better. Or maybe the other way. Anyhow, I'll figure that out after I iron them. piece was my first big section and it has let's see it has 12 triangles and um, I think 16 squares so it's a pretty big section and a big piece of material so I actually had to measure and cut this one on the floor sorry for the noise that's that's the baby with his walker. 
which he loves. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, the reason I do most of my stuff in um, time lapse and then with bits in the have spoken stuff is because I have three kids <laughs> and none of them have ever slept very much so uh, and they're pretty noisy so um, when <laughs> when I'm trying to film stuff they I mean they try to be quiet but let's face it they're all under the age of four. Well, under the age of five. One is four. And they're just not very good at that. So, if I do it in time lapse, rather than speeding things up, you don't get any weird background noises. I would love to just speed it up and have all those little cutting and ripping noises sped up in the background because I always think that that is just the coolest thing ever. But... You would also hear my children screaming in the background, which would not be the coolest thing ever. So, I, uh, I use time lapse for that. Also, if I have to, like, go open the gate to the bathroom for the big girl so she can go to the bathroom, you barely even notice that I'm gone because everything's so sped up. It looks like I just stopped doing something for a second. Or, you know, if yeah something happens anyway so that's why i do things in time lapse most of the time and i think it's far more enjoyable for you guys than it would be with all the background noise because trust me it is a lot of background noise so before things start getting noisy again I think I'll put you back on time lapse. Speed this up a bit. between a third and a half of my pieces cut. I'm not sure exactly, but somewhere in there. Um, and I think that's all I'm gonna get done today because I gotta start dinner. But I have triangles and half squares. And uh, see, that's the, they're the same size, they match up. Um, and I'm sure that there will be somebody watching this who is cringing at the fact that I have not ironed these before I cut them. And for other things, I would iron it, but um, I don't feel it's really necessary with this kind of work. And anything that's not necessary is just a waste of time that I don't really have. So that's why I haven't ironed them. If it makes you feel more comfortable, you go right ahead and iron them. But uh, I've got about half those done, and I'll work on it again later. You won't know it's later, because I'll just hook all the videos together. But um, I've got those done, and then I've got, oh goodness, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five more rows of different colors to go, and then we'll start piecing these together and I want to say in case I forget later that as tempting as it might be to uh, start from the middle and do everything in order by color that's not really a very good idea because well I mean you could do it I guess if you're hand sewing it might be okay but it's much easier if you start from one end and work your way up to the top or down to the bottom, whichever way. But it's much easier if you work in rows than in blocks of color. So, I'm going to go for now. Um, you won't know the difference. I'll be back later. And we'll finish cutting out blocks. And then we'll start hooking them together. And eventually we'll get to sewing them. So, 
I just wanted to talk a little bit real quick about the material that I get. Um, most of it I get from their shops um, as seconds. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes they're big pieces, sometimes they're small pieces. Around here you can get things at their shops for a pretty good deal most of the time. But you don't have to be limited in your choice to just material that people have donated. So for example, um, this is an old pillowcase, which obviously wasn't really used very much. There's no stains or thin spots, but it's a nice material and a nice pattern. So, you know, when you go out looking for stuff, always keep an open mind. Sheets and pillowcases are always good options. Um, shirts are often good options. My only um, warning or caution is being careful of the material. A lot of newer sheets, um, they feel nice, but they're made out of a synthetic material, and if you were to try and iron them, they would just melt, essentially. So, um, and they also fray really easily on the edges. So just be careful of the kind of material it is, but always be open-minded about where your material is coming from. Because there are lots of great options if you just keep your eyes open. Plaid shirts are also a great one for non-traditional flowery kind of materials. Um, yeah, so button up shirts. Um, all the shirts typically cost the same price no matter how big they are, so go look for the super extra large ones. <laughs> um, or, you know, just anything that you can find that's a good material with a nice pattern. This is what I get for doing things early in the morning. It is currently 6.53. So. <sighs> well, at least I didn't do it twice. And it's not that big of a deal. It's just more work. So these two were both supposed to just be squares. <laughs> so I'm going to have to re-sew these back together, which is fine. It's not a big deal. But it would have been so much easier if I hadn't done that. So, my tip. Don't do it unless you've had a couple cups of coffee instead of only one. Need some more of that. Um, anyway. So, not a big deal. I'll just sew them back together. And then there's those ones. And I only have one more color left to do, but I have to count out how many squares, not triangles, that I need um, before I can cut them out. And then that'll be the end of this video, I guess. And after that, I will see you in my next one where I'll be hooking them. Uh, well, no. First, I have to iron them. Yeah, I can't forget that. That is very important. Before you sew them together, always make sure you iron them because yeah, it can just come out weird if they're not ironed. Um, if you do have the option to take a quilting class, I would definitely recommend that. Um, I took a class when I was in high school and although I don't f follow a lot of the methods that I learned in that class um, there were a lot of things that were really helpful and I feel like if you learn how to quilt once like with assistance from a teacher that uh, 
it really can help you a lot in the long run and make things a lot easier. So if you have that available as an option, I would definitely recommend going ahead and taking a class uh, instead of just trying to figure it out by yourself. But if you don't have that as an option, um, please feel free to uh, comment below and leave me any questions that you might have about quilting if it's your first time or if you're just not very confident in it and I will do my best to answer those questions and try to be as helpful as possible because you know sometimes it's rough when you're trying to do things by yourself so if you have any questions please leave me a comment down below and uh, let me know if you like this channel um, and you want to keep up with it please uh, subscribe like share all that good stuff and uh, I'll see you soon solid pieces on the outside edge and it's like a total of 144 squares and there's way more than I was expecting so either I did something wrong with the math which is possible or well anyway either way that's just a whole lot of squares so I'm gonna double check my math and then uh, if it is the right number, I'll see if I have that much, which I kind of think I don't. And if I don't, then I'm going to have to improvise and change the pattern. Maybe make some of these squares something different. Make a double border color. So we'll see how that goes. And that's the other fun part about making quilts from scraps is you have to be very flexible with your plans. So after a little bit more math, I figured out what the problem is, which I think I remember coming across this before with um, these kinds of patterns, is they tend to be very square. However, twin blanket is not square. So the way I have it set up, it would end up being 80 inches long, which is how long I want it, but it would also end up being 80 inches wide, which is way too wide. I only need it to be 60 inches wide. So my option is to cut these two off. But then that means that there will be dark up here and no dark on this side of my pattern. And I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. I mean, it doesn't matter a whole lot because, <laughs> you know, I just can't make it 80 inches. Well, I could, but it would be way too big for the bed. <laughs> so, I have to think about this for a little bit, get back to it. But while I'm waiting, I'll make it 60 and see how much I need if it's only 60 inches wide and then see if I have enough to do that.
a little bit more math and I figure that I can do uh, with 12 pieces made at 60 inches wide that's six. Um, I can do two rows of the dark brown and then I have one left over that I can put in the corner and then there's three rows there I'm thinking uh, maybe I have to check how much I have of each but I'm thinking I'll make the middle row dark purple and then these two rows yellow or I'll make this dark purple and these two rows yellow depending on how much I have of each color so now it's time for me to go and see what else I have to fill up that space but essentially I'll have two rows of dark brown here and the corner will be dark brown and then, of course, there will be an edge on the outside, which will hold it all together, so it won't look completely weird. Okay, so I have almost enough to do two full rows of yellow. I'm one square short because the corner is cut off the material. So if I can find some yellow that's either the same or almost exactly the same, which I might have some, I can go ahead and do two rows of yellow. If not, my thought is to, I'll use this so you can see. My thought is to make the purple in this shape off the corner and then the yellow right this isn't accurate coloring I know but still the yellow would be in this shape which I might actually kind of like that better so I think I'm gonna do it that way Now that I've got all of those cut out, that's all the, the pieces for the quilt um, in order. So this is the middle and this is the outside corners. So before I get to ironing those, I want to make a quick note about a rather annoying byproduct of quilt making. And that is all the scraps, the teeny tiny pieces from the edges of things and all the thread that you get from the edges of the pieces that you've cut. And it is very annoying, but it's not completely useless. And I don't throw it away. So what I do is when I have stuff like this from a sewing project or ends of thread from a uh, crocheting or knitting project, anything like that, I have a bag that I keep it in and I save it for stuffing for any other projects that I have. If I'm making some sock animals or a pillow or I don't know, a bum roll for an 18th century costume, you know, anything that needs to be stuffed, these are great for stuffing. And then you don't have to buy stuffing. Now, this wouldn't make a very nice stuffing. Just a minute, then. Uh, this wouldn't make very good stuffing for a quilt. Now you could do that, but you'd have to do some serious quilting to make sure it didn't get lumped up and moved around. And that would be a real pain in the butt. So you could do that, but um, I wouldn't suggest it. But by no means throw it away. Don't waste good, as I always like to say. 
if it's useful, use it. So that's what I use this for. I don't throw it away. I keep it and I save it in a bag for stuffing projects. All right. So I have all my pieces cut out. Now it is time to iron them. And then in the next video, I will be laying them out and pinning them together. And then after I get all that done, we'll start sewing.